Comfortable, I start then, Julie. Po Maria e te whanau, uh, ko Shapi Ian Shapcott, Takeo Noa. I'm uh, a Kotiaki Tanga representative of uh, Tiatiawa uh, o Te Waka o Maui, uh, who is a Tangata Whenua Iwi in Nelson and Marlborough, and uh, hence um, I'm representing them uh, by opening with a Katakia. Ino Tato. Whakatakata hau ki te uru, whakatakata hau ki te taonga, ki makina ki ki uta, ki mataratara ki tai, i hei aki ana te atakura hi tiao, i huka, i hohu, ti hei mari ora. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to um, what feels like a bit of a a closing, not just because of the closing of the year, but a closing of a really huge piece of work that has been undertaken over the last, goodness, uh, eight months by the Climate Forum. Um, not closed because we have reached a consensus and approved anything, but in the sense that this is our last hui at which we will look at the draft and feed into it and improve it. Um, at the next time we meet, we're going to go for that um, approval process um, as the first iteration of um, our Regional Strategic Climate Action Plan. So thank you for being here today to help consider these new sections and to help um, make them as excellent as they can be. Um, we're also here to put that work into context and um, I'm delighted to welcome Shappi here today um, who has put in a huge amount of work behind the scenes um, for the Climate Forum from its very beginning, from its seed um, within the working group that was thinking about how best to create it through the drafting of the charter that we hope will also be ready at our next hui to sign in February. Um, and making sure that um, the work that we do um, strategically does not have um, only a human-centric Pakia approach to a climate change response, but also um, as much as we are able um, incorporates Te Ao Māori and other um, ways of looking at how we can respond. Um, and so I'm delighted that he has um, put forward some time uh, for us tonight um, to tell us a little bit more about what that might look like for us to take his thoughts into our coming session on our strategic action plan um, and to really make it something this region can be proud of. Um, I think that's quite enough from me. Um, so over to you, Shappi. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. Bring my slideshow, thank you, to Nakwe. Uh, how are we there, Jess? Are we big enough? I uh, just give it a one minute to load on our screens, Shappy. Yep, okay. there it is. And if you wanted to hit play on that slideshow, we'll then be able to see the full, full thing. So, okay, so you, you, you um, tell me where I hit play. Uh, um, see, up in the top left hand corner, there's like the little save button, and then two over from that, there's like a display button. Oh, yeah. That yeah. one. I think, at that. I think that should do it. Oh, you were in business. Okay. Right. I'll just have to um, park the string of you guys over to the side so I can see what I'm doing. I hope that wasn't too rough. Um, so, um, yeah, Pomare Anno. Um, what I've assembled here is just some thoughts around the Māori world and Kaitiakitanga, the practice of uh, the traditional cultural practice of, of custodial management in simple terms. Um, you can drill into that, it can be quite a lot more subtle and complex. Um, so, running on, um, I'm trying to 
see the screen properly. Um, so I, I've introduced myself. I, I work for Te Atiyo Manafino Kiti Te Ihu Trust, and I'm a member of our Kati Atiyo Te Taio team, the, the KT team. And the role of the KT team is to support the Kaitiaki Tanga responsibilities of, of Te Atiyo Te, te Atiyo Afano. Um, I'm a, a long-term friend of Te Atiyo's. I've had a relationship with them for over 45 years. Uh, I've been working with them for oh, over 35 years professionally and for them um, around 10 years. And so I'm, I, I'm, I'm part of the Fano to all intents and purposes. Um, so iwi Māori in the contemporary world, I, I, it's just an orientation um, process, a few slides here. I'm not trying to, uh, with this presentation, convince anybody of anything. I'm just exposing um, uh, the evening to some thinking and, and some um, insights that we've developed in our work over the last years. So in this post-settlement world, and if you bear with me, I'll, I'll read the slides to you if you could follow them. Uh, it's vitally important that Crown Pakeha side of the treaty, the treaty gains an understanding of Māori living, participating in the 21st century. It's our shared contemporary world, the world of Aotearoa. So we've got Te Ao Māori and Te Ao Pakeha, those two worlds coalescing, two parallel and complete cultural worlds which exist side by side. Okay, key factors to enable an understanding of this circumstances, circumstance involves kinship and time. So kinship, a tikanga Māori, Māori culture interprets the natural, biophysical, metaphysical world, um, utter the deities who gave rise to it, including humans, as totally interrelated. All entities, whakapapa, relate to each other. It's holism in our European cultural sense. And I'm, I'm, I'm amongst holism adherents there, otherwise we wouldn't be all talking around uh, the climate forum, I'm sure. So time, as a consequence of, of Māori culture, Māori understand about the heritage legacy provided by the past, the mana, the status of their ancestors, and the cultural knowledge that has been passed on to the living generation. This knowledge from the past provides for affiliated continuity for Māori and inherently contributes information, knowledge, understanding, guidance, wisdom and direction enables the present world to be interpreted intelligently, richly and with perspective so that the current experience and future vision can be given an informed context. It's all very well me saying that and it's all very well Māori having that tikanga historically. The, the difficulty is in the, in the damage from colonisation uh, over 150 years now uh, from the treaty. We, uh, Māori Dam is struggling to to refine itself in the post-settlement world uh, the, that is at a um, socio-cultural level, at a, at a health level, at a, at a level of, of um, economic um, um, prosperity and the like. Māridom is struggling forward. It's not a plain and simple um, time for them. So third time, Māori culture is not locked in the past. Quite often when we're dealing with agencies and councils and the like, they're just thinking, oh, the, the Māori, they've got some legacy there. There's a few middens. There might have been a pa there once, et cetera, et cetera. It ain't like that. <laughs> Simply not involving what happened years ago, along with its physical le legacy. Māori culture is a living experience, as uh, our colleague that's just uh, done level two will tell you, and it evolves as time passes so that today's world is adapted to. Māori culture provides holism in time, a synthesis, a synthesis of past, present and future, which underpins a living understanding about today and tomorrow and how to approach those life circumstances with a realistic intelligence. Accordingly for Māori, the contemporary world constitutes holism in both kinship and time. This outcome come enables Māori to live in, adapt to and be actively involved in a culturally influenced and current way today, engaging actively with commitment in our shared contemporary world. This is how iwi Māori are naturally engaged as the Crown's treaty partner. This is our association with central government agencies, locally with DOC particularly, and with the councils who are empowered by Crown statute. And so the place we are in, the, the custodial responsibility, the place I live and work in and am embedded in daily, iwi members are kaitiaki and guardians within this region and carry an intergenerational responsibility for ensuring that the Māori or essential life principle of the natural world is maintained, thereby exercising kaitiaki tanga. As kaitiaki of this rohi, tia tiaua, iwi, my employer is interested to support those who will respect the environment and acknowledge the Indigenous people. That's why the chair of the day, uh, Archdeacon Harvey Ruru, 
um, nominated me and empowered me to join the Climate Forum because we saw this as a very positive step in Kotiaki Tanga. I can't be Kotiaki because I'm not Māori and I'm not Tangata Whenua Māori either. Our office supports the whānau to carry out Kotiaki responsibilities. One of the things that occurs regularly is that um, the collective community, particularly um, agencies and NGOs and the like, uh, in ignorance, I'll, I'll give them that, that latitude, um, loop Māori in with stakeholders, and that's, that's the thing of fundamental um, uh, insult to Tangata Whenua Iwi to Māori. Iwi take offence has been collected in with stakeholders because they are the Indigenous people of Aotearoa, the Crown's treaty partner. They hold mana whenua and mana moana in the rohi, in other words, the status of responsibility for the land and sea. As the people of land, the ace, Tita Ihu, top of the south, oh, I've got a spelling mistake there, have ahi karoa, um, continuous occupation, title to the land through occupation. The, the ahi karoa is the fires continuing, continually burning since occupation. And so Maridam is host to all who live, work, play and die in the top of the south, irrespective. One of the other things that um, the tikanga around um, to tire the natural world, which includes the people, throws up is discomfort at the term resource, and which is the focus of the Resource Management Act, which we're looking at to review, and which is well outdated and philosophically bankrupt, and this confronts it. The term resource is an inappropriate Eurocentric, anthropocentric term in the context of Rohi, area of interest management, and the real world. As the Atua, the ancestors that embrace nature, Papa Tuanuka and Rangi and their progeny are part of Māori whakapapa, or pa related to Māori ancestors um, and deities. Uh, their status should not be lowered simply to that of a resource for human use and abuse. And of course, as we know, all the um, other creatures, aside from ourselves, that make the collective biota of Tatai of the world, uh, have their own intrinsic worth to themselves. And so why would you simply nail them as a, in the lowly space as a resource? So these natural att attributes of which humans are but one part, one attribute, each have their own intrinsic worth. For example, fresh, fresh water is innately an attribute of nature, a taonga, but simply not just a resource for human use abuse. And so for kotiaki, uh, fresh water is only justifiable for use as a resource for humans if and when it is healthy. Its Māori is elevated and it is used sustainably, responsibly in accordance with tikanga, kotiaki tanga, the custodial branch of that. Um, where we sit with um, our engagement with our host, the, the, the natural world of which we're a part, uh, where we sit with that, it's a cause and effect regime and, and the responsibility resides with us and we haven't done well as we know and here we are in the climate forum trying to reverse those things. Change, where, where we sit in, in our Kotiaki office, we're constantly involved with uh, proposals for change, uh, many, many of them through the uh, resource consent process uh, of which we would deal with in excess of a thousand a year. And, and so our, our notion around what change is about, all and any proposal for prospective change are not about growth, development, progress, or any other inherently flawed and deceptively positive notion. It is simply about a proposal for change and needs to be exhaustively evaluated and progressed in that context. With precaution, consciously applied to decision-making where there is inadequate information and doubt. So what sort of change might there be? Negative, positive, or no change at all? In today's known collapsing natural and social world, there is no defensible choice other than supporting action that enables, and this is a pivotal point for our work, net enduring restorative outcomes, which I'll develop as we go on. Being, as we touch something and it's going to change, we want a positive outcome in the, in the round. So the view is to ultimately achieving restoration towards a regenerative state, which I'll visit in, in a slide or two. And as part of this, we're always looking at carrying capacity and limits to change. And I, I just, one of the things that always hits us in the face, we work in Queen Charlotte Sound, um, and there's no all of base solutions for intervention. There's no uh, immediate um, um, situation of saying, what's the carrying capacity of Waikawa Bay for the number of moorings, the number of jetties, the number of boat movements, the number of whatever. Um, we need to be able to, as we, as we overload ourselves and degrade, we need to be able to know what the change, what the carrying capacity thresholds are and what its limits are and pull back. So our, our working definition is the various points, thresholds at which changes to Tataya, the environment, which threatens to degrade it, become un un unacceptable within precautionary limits. 
this is all stuff we, we throw out in response to uh, uh, discussions and, and confrontations over um, people having aspirations that haven't been thought through. The, 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 the uh, road to destruction is paved with good ideas, we've found. So aspirations and expectations, given the greater, degraded state and continuing degraded state of the Rohi, um, the area of interest for, for Tangata Whenua uh, the state of the environment monitoring supports this. The, the, uh, our annual outcomes are just confirming that we're not managing it well. It is obviously essential that all decision making and the consequent outcomes of change, including whatever project, enable positive restorative outcomes for Tataya, which naturally includes the whānau, the people. So because of this circumstance, it cannot be business as usual in the Rohi. I know I'm talking to the converted, so forgive me. Uh, consequently, to meet cultural responsibilities required by Kaitiaki Tanga, the Kaitiaki of, te, of, of te Taia office seek that all prospective change result in net enduring restorative outcomes. And so what's that mean? So we'll visit that, a couple of slides. So our team, the Kaitiaki of te Taia team, the KT team for Te Atiao and Mana Whenua Ki Te Tau Ihu Trust, we're a charitable trust, understands, is advised from current findings of Mataranga Māori, Māori knowledge and Western science that the natural world, which includes the socio-cultural world of the human species, is being progressively de degraded by unwise human activity slash behaviour. And here we are on the case. Climate change impacts are an overt expression, symptom of this continuing process, as is the widening gap in wealth equity between haves and have-nots in Aotearoa. You don't have to research very deeply to confirm all those things. Slide two. The situation which adversely confronts the exercise of kaitiakitanga, our role, has arisen as a consequence of a long sequence of human decisions and actions that have enabled collective unsustainable change. We've reached a point at which it is clear that human survival is at stake. And also in conscience, noting our responsibility, that this outcome has meant the extinction of many other species. We're working on ourselves, so maybe that's uh, something to contemplate. Uh, to hold an attempt to reverse this unacceptable outcome, all decisions and actions that deliver change must improve our current situation be restorative. The change, changes must also endure if they are to be meaningfully contributory. Change is mostly multifactorial in its implications. So for the aggregation, for the aggregated elements of any particular change, for example, a housing development, the net outcomes of those collective elements of change must be positive. So where do we go from there? Accordingly, the KT team in undertaking its day-to-day -day mahi in evaluating respond, responding responsibly to proposals for change, and their related implications for Tataio, our natural world, is seeking that resulting change delivers, whoops, I've just got to move, move us up, up uh, net enduring restorative outcomes. In other words, elevating, strengthening Māori, the life force. And down a slide. And so here's where we are in, in our work is that um, it's all, it was all very well having kaitiaki tongue and having the kaitiaki there, but in the traditional sense and pre-colonisation and once Māori them had settled down in Aotearoa after experimenting with who they were where, um, they, they were in a relatively harmonious state and they were daily engaging with the natural world and their life and survival depended directly on their local natural world, the kai, the materials for shelter and on and on, medicines and the like. And so uh, naturally living and working amongst that uh, the relationship was um, a subconscious engagement that you knew inherently that something might be wrong, that a storm had taken um, the cockle beds away or whatever, and so you would manage it accordingly, not go there, put a rahui on it or, or the like. But it was, it was very um, sensitively um, pitched because the relationship was intimate. The tatai of the natural world was uh, in relative balance and change uh, was survival threatening and you were intimate. We're not there anymore. Uh, we're, we're looking at contemporary kaitiaki tanga because we're looking at the contemporary world where we're being confronted by things like climate change and what's underpinned that. So in accordance with that challenge, uh, we've developed a framework for our own work here and it's kikaka based, uh, based upon the customary system of values that have developed over time acknowledging and respecting the Atu, the ancestors, the deities, all ideas tested against Māori knowledge, um, imp implemented through kaitiaki tanga, the responsible stewardship, through responsible stewardship, which I've worked on, focusing on the life force essence, and then all the work, all mahi to result in net enduring restorative outcomes, elevating, strengthening Māori, all work to result in 
outcomes to restore the health of the natural world, money before money, ecology before economy, acknowledging our global context. There's no escape. What we're doing uh, has wider implications. Think tourism, which we're currently engaging with in the COVID space and thinking where we go. Um, and so the goal here is healthy planet, healthy people. And we're looking at a healthy, balanced natural world, which includes the human species, people with a quality, sustainable lifestyle, which is underpinned by socio-cultural equity and justice. So all these parameters that I'm sort of dropping down are, are, are our day-to-day -day work. Uh, it's what shapes our focus and, and, and tests uh, what we confront and drives our, our proactive actions for restoration. So just this, a lot of discussion, regenerative has become a buzzword, a bit like bespoke and a few other words have come in recent years. And I've had to, to peer into regenerative and, and think where it sits because we're dealing with people who want to carry out regenerative activities. Uh, so we've looked at, at uh, defining what it is. A continuing regenerative state is a state of helpful self-renewal, a self-perpetuating harmonious balance. It is an arrival point a destination not attained without the necessary hickory journey. We will be severely challenged to reach that very desirable and necessary destination as the background socio-cultural world is framed, firmly framed to oppose and obstruct that hickory and the containing eco web, web has suffered irredeemable damage. And so as we paddle our walker into the climate change solution, uh, there are stormy seas ahead and uh, I'm sure we'll cope with them. And so uh, we've, we've then, and we keep reframing our, our uh, approach to these things, but here we've got um, a desired state and regenerative world linked into um, the, the um, first, the, the indigenous cultures, which includes Māori. So the holism of the planet, the, the way it's interpreted in, in uh, Te Kanga Māori and in reality, uh, we've got me singly as the blue and as the, as the greeny blue, is a lot of us and then we've got the planet our mother and father enveloping us so so that's our sort of current mental model of of how the whole thing sits and uh, so we've got um to tie over the natural biophysical metaphysical socio-cultural world well within that the common human good and recognizing the individual for individual context and this is a desired state in a regenerative world the world that is understood by maori and interpreting how you manage that uh we've developed this next framework and we're saying people are an inextricable part of Tataya, the planet. People, funnily enough, people require specific management due to their conscious, mostly non-sympathetic intervention in system functionality. And so we've looked at how we live. Um, and for instance, I've stolen stuff. If you go into the, into the right livelihood column on the right there, uh, that's stolen from potentially uh, the, the Hindu philosopher of 200 AD and Ernst Schumacher, the, the, uh, the German philosopher who's uh, conceived um, um, a, a modern um, form of, of Buddhist economics. But as we work, so our right livelihood, the day-to-day -day mahi, what I've been doing for Tia Chia, our work pra practices uh, need to be based upon positive outcomes for the planet and the people, as we see above. And then we go to the day-to-day -day living, which we've added our thinking here. So we've got our necessary work practices and our necessary daily living practices, right living and right livelihood. Right living is living practices based upon positive outcomes for the planet and people. So in a regenerative world, and this is the bottom line, these practices become customary. It's just what we do. We get used to being, uh, to living in favour of each other and our host, and we test everything against it. And then our good old mate, the economy, uh, isn't up there as a god or an atua anymore. It's sitting in the basement as our servant. The economy must possibly support the health of the planet and people. It's a human construction for the management of goods and services. Uh, so deifying that with the atua of, uh, of Māori doesn't, doesn't quite coalesce. So desirable human behaviour which supports a regenerative natural world, the basis of re achieving regenerative management. I'm just about on time, Jesse. That's very good, just by accident. Um, and here's my closing slide pretty well. Uh, so here's the de desire to state, state in a regenerative world. So our present biophysical, metaphysical, socio-cultural world is extensively degraded. Consequently, all actions, and I'm drawing the threads together, must result in net enduring restorative outcomes and be responsibly moderated by precaution. Outcomes derived strategically from this approach can progressively set the compass towards a regenerative natural world state. And those things I've said before, healthy planet, healthy people, and 
the bottom line uh, is sitting there. Um, and I've got questions. I don't. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a few questions if you like, but I don't have any debate to to to, to contend with here. This is just day to day mahi, and I'm sharing it with you. So over to you, Julie. Thank you. You're right. Kia ora, Shepi. Thank you so much for that flood of fantastic wisdom. Much appreciated. Um, if you do have questions for Shepi, please pop them in the chat. I've got a few to kick us off. <laughs> it's okay. Um, my first one um, came to mind when you mentioned that your work um, is about supporting the whānau to exercise their kaitiakitanga. And I'm wondering what could the Climate Forum do that could support um, the whānau of Te Tauihu to undertake that work? Well, at the present moment, um, it's, it's um, evolving itself. It's turning itself into to a being uh, that can successfully meet the challenges. Um, and I suppose the best way that that can occur is our mutual relationships develop and we're ever conscious of uh, us coming together and supporting one another. I, I, I just think it sits in that um, collection of community that we're evolving. Um, and and from, our, from the perspective of, of representing Tangata Whenua Iwi, um, there'll be times when we can have more engagement um, with the whānau, with the collective that's developing. At the present moment, people are just trying to put tie on the table. And, and, and my colleagues and I, as you know, are just paddling a sinking walker post-settlement because there's just so much to do to recover. But what we do know, and you shared this with us when you came to our tire practitioners meeting, is that there's a great willingness uh, for, for engagement. And so I think uh, that willingness, if that willingness sits and evolves and your, uh, the animal of the climate forum uh, defines itself, then those connections will be uh, forthcoming. A question from Joanna. Um, you were talking about carrying capacity. It seems an important and a difficult concept to grapple with as a climate forum. Um, could you expand on that concept a little bit in the context of this, Rohe? Okay, so in terms of the human intervention in a, in, in a, in a place um, like, for instance, in, like Picton Harbour, I'm looking at, I'm very blessed to be looking at a Picton Harbour here, for instance. And so um, you had you had a, a stable ecosystem there, which had a massive wetland um, and it had uh, great colonies and schools of fish um, uh, and, and bottom life and everything. And uh, nobody thought that, uh, that humans coming in and the way they did it would corrupt that and, and destroy it. And so, so the uh, so, so we're in a situation, I suppose, in, in terms of carrying capacity, where if you go back to the net enduring restorative outcomes model and say, will the change that we're proposing degrade or improve that? Um, and so if it's going to degrade it and, you're actu and you've got a, a precautionary view as well, so if there's any doubt, you must assume it will, uh, you've, you've reached the threshold of carrying capacity because human intervention additional human intervention will degrade it. So it succeeded its current capacity. It's a very simple thing. I've been hammering Doc particularly about this for years about the Doc estate as it affects local things uh, in, the, in the Doc estate, uh, the infrastructure around it, the roading and all those sorts of things, and then going beyond there to international travel because people are attracted to come. Um, and I've been saying, you need to understand all those rings from the center of your activity working out to see whether it's, it's sustainable. Uh, is the carrying capacity of, of Marlborough, of the top of the south, of Te Waipanamu, Aotearoa, et cetera, being exceeded? And if it is, you go to plan B. So it's all about the ability to cope with intervention. If you've got de degradation, you've exceeded the carrying capacity. It sounds like a very long explanation. But, but I'll tell you some good news is that after me beating them to death for about 10 years, Doc is going there. DOC is going there and COVID has helped that. But I'm working with a national pilot project now uh, that's um, all about restorative tourism. So that the notion of this is to set up a model where when tourism comes into the DOC estate, the place, that's the immediate place, the region, Aotearoa, is left in a better state than when the people came. And so that includes also the distance they travel, um, 
and ways in which they can themselves can physically contribute. It also is about numbers. So numbers and behaviour, basically. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, and one more question, even though we're slightly over time, um, from Colin. Um, he's thinking about the lifestyle, that living well concept um, that you mentioned. And if we put into place all these changes that encouraged that net enduring restorative outcomes, what do you, what do you imagine that new lifestyle to look like? Including well, thinking about uh, adaptation to climate change. Yes, so, so it's, it's like this, and I'll just, I'll just um, look at our, our work, our right livelihood, for instance. So that means the work we do, and you would set your taxation system on this, if I was Jacinda Ardern, this is my taxation system, is that if the work isn't contributing positively to the planet and people, you tax it out of existence. And so in working in right livelihood, in other words, knowing you're making a contribution and also being rewarded for it, on the one hand, you're motivated and fulfilled because you're contributing positively and helping things, uh, helping us journey to a better world. And on the other hand, uh, you're being paid uh, well for it because the system has to pay equi equi equitably. And so those two things in that particular case. Uh, and the other thing is that all the um, social science that we have from the point of view of, of uh, anecdotes from history and the great teachers, plus modern socio-cultural research, suggests that our major fulfilment comes from making contributions, not acquiring. And so what, what, what's happened to us and put us in this place, of course, is we've been socialised by marketing to the point where our gods are false. <laughs> and it's going to take a while to journey to a new place. And it's not going to be straightforward. But the issue being is if we don't do it relatively rapidly, we won't be here to enjoy the future. Mm. I, I imagine part of that transition will be about reconnecting uh, with the Tayo. It will be, and with each other. I mean, I'm just, as I, as I see communities change and as I see um, the electronic media replace one-on-one -on -one connections and, and all those sorts of interpersonal things that we have with the intimacy with our neighbours and all those sorts of things. Uh, so obviously, as we're part of Tataya, but humans have been the, the, the uh, mechanism whereby we've degraded our host, but also we've got the ability to be, we're the only way that we can fix it. And so uh, the, the issue being is that most of the people I encounter don't know there's a problem. <laughs> which is interesting stuff. And that in itself, I mean, you're watching, watching the young generation. I'm not a kid. Most people know that I'm nearly 74. Um, and, and I'm seeing that the, the new generation is coming to a different drumbeat, which as we pass, uh, that drumbeat um, is more familiar to them than the residual population we've got now. And so that will be part of the passage of change will be succession. And, and one of my um, places in the scheme of things is to try and support that succession positively and try and enable the young people coming through to achieve governance relatively rapidly because it's their future at stake and they need to have a stakeholding in it actually. Thank you. I have plenty more questions for you, um, but I'll have to tackle those another day. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shappy, for your time. Really appreciate sure, it. And, and uh, uh, um supports whoever wishes to close, uh, cl close this evening, Tui. And uh, a pleasure to be here. And pardon me, I'm just heading off to have a meal. And, and so thanks for tolerating my short appearance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you That's been wonderful. Kira all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, goodness. How lucky are we to have such incredible engagement from our um, local iwi. Um, OK, let's move on. Joe, you've got a tough act to follow, assuming you are presenting for the, um, the ASCAP team this evening. I am, and yes, <laughs> I, I, I feel most grateful to Shappy for that. And, and I feel that it, it creates a, a super context uh, for us to, to uh, proceed to our next task. Um, Okay, I'll just clear the screen so I can see everyone's faces. And um, kia ora, koutou. Uh, what, what we're doing together is ha having a look, as Julie said, at the, the last section of the re um, Regional Strategic Climate Action Plan, 
or as we affectionately call it, the ASCAP. Um, and uh, really trying to uh, engage with, with the material there and give us some feedback on it. L let me just remind you of, of the context of this, that last HUI, we talked about the introduction uh, which, which dealt with the, this, the state of the world and emissions and uh, regional emissions and so on, mitigation and adaptation. Now, this time we're looking at a couple of sections, one on vision and values and the other on our responses to goal three. Just to remind you what goal three is uh, in the forum, uh, it's respond to climate change in a way that recognizes the rights of all living organisms, including people, and provides for a just, equitable, and resilient society. So you can see how that relates to Shappy's talk. Uh, in the document, it has the heading, a well-being centered transition. And I, I'd like to say just a little bit about how these sections were generated. Uh, with vision and values, the, what, the foundation of that was work that forum participants did in the July HUI on vision and values. And then all of the, um, the, the group strategic plans were scanned uh, for material that related to vision and values. And, and that was added in. And then there was some study of vision and values of other organizations uh, as, and with particular attention to Te Tau Iho, Ihu intergenerational strategy. So those, those were the things that went into the mix of generating the material you're about to engage with on vision and values. Similarly for a well-being centered transition there, and it was Olivia Hyatt who, who particularly worked on this section. There was a scan of the strategic action plans of all of the uh, working groups uh, for material that related to this issue. And, and out of that was synthesized the section that you're about to work on. So what are, what are you to do next? Um, we're going to form into breakout groups and in, in the context uh, of what you've just heard from Shappy, and also in the context of the huge necessary changes ahead in our ways of living and in our cultural values. One, is this a sufficient response that we have in the document? Is there anything missing? And is there anything that you have strong reservations or concerns about? So um, when you get into the groups, please appoint a note taker and the, the note taker will have access to a Google Doc. And I think, I think Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that Google Doc is attached to the agenda. Yeah, jo Julie's just popped it in the chat as well. So there's a link to the Google document there. Um, so if the note taker for each group could just add comments in that um, Google document as you go through, then we can see them all afterwards and we won't miss out on anything. That's uh, just a PDF, Jesse. I couldn't see a link to the Google doc in there. Oh, please add your comments to this document. I'll just grab the link one second. Sorry, I put the wrong link in. No, that's all good. So that, the one that Julie has put in is the entire document. Um, so you can see where things fit in in context. And then the one I've just shared is only the new sections. So in your breakout rooms, we're just asking to discuss only those new sections of the Ask It. That's correct. And, and this uh, freely editable um, Google Doc will only be open for this session. And thereafter, if you have further suggestions that you want to make, make those by email to me and you'll find my address in, in this evening's agenda. And those, those ideas will be passed on to the Climate Action Plan group, uh, which will then 
be working on your suggestions over the next few weeks. Um, the, and the deadline for those emails is this Friday, 5 p.m. Any questions on what you're about to do and how to do it? Okay, excellent. That's it for me. Uh, Colin, you have a question? You oh, need to sorry. unmute, please. Trying to, trying to get my mic working. Yeah. Julie, could you just repeat the three key points that you wanted us to address? Yes, thank you. The questions are, is it sufficient? Is there anything missing? Oh. And is there anything you have strong reservations or concerns about? Um, Jesse's just popped those in the chat for you. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, so we're going to randomly put you into uh, five groups, um, rather than trying to get each group to have a member of the ASCAP group in it to begin with. If those ASCAP group people find themselves in a group with another ASCAP group, can you please come back to them?